Good afternoon, everyone. Buonasera or buenas tardes. Uh, today uh, it's our 24th lecture, not day, 20, 24th lecture of liver imaging online series. We had several excellent colleagues, experts from all over the states uh, speaking to us about uh, various topics in, in the liver imaging. And today it's my honor and the pleasure to introduce a good friend and colleague from Cincinnati. Alex, this is Dr. Alexander Tobin. Uh, Alexander, Dr. Alexander Tobin is a professor of radiology and the Neil Johnson Chair of Radiology Informatics, as well as Associate Chief of Radiology. Uh, in clinical operation and radiology informatics at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. We all know what Cincinnati Children's Hospital and what it means. It's one of the top, if not the best, children's hospital. Uh, he is a recognized leader in pediatric radiology and imaging informatics. In his clinical role, Dr. Tobin specializes in pediatric abdominal imaging. His research focuses on cancer imaging, imaging of the liver, clinical informatics, and quality improvement. Dr. Tubman received his medical degree from the University of Cincinnati, so he's been very loyal to Cincinnati. So we have to be careful not to mess with Cincinnati then. His residency in diagnostic radiology at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and his fellowship in pediatric radiology at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. He returned back to Cincinnati at uh, uh, the fellowship. Apart from, from his current role in Cincinnati Children's Medical Center and the University of Cincinnati, Dr. Tobin is also an active member of multiple organizations. RSNA, like me, ACR, like me too, uh, Society of Pediatric Radiology, unlike me, Children's Oncology Group, also unlike me, but I'm just saying like me because I actually just found that we both are fellows of the International Cancer Imaging Society. And the acronym for this is ISIS. Seriously, they call it ISIS. But I'm trying to tell them it's ICAS, International Cancer Imaging Society. He has won numerous awards of his teaching and his research, and he's a frequent speaker at uh, meetings across the United States, but not only the, the United States, but also the world, speaking on a wide range of topics, including the imaging of pediatric liver tumors, customer service, operational planning, quality improvement, and social media. Dr. Tobin is well published, having written more than 135 peer review articles and 110 uh, book chapters. With that, I would actually invite Dr. Tobin to start talking about assessment of pediatric liver tumors. Alex? Thank you. Um, thanks for everyone for being here. I'm excited to share the share your day with you. Um, as I start, I'll point out that um, the department at Cincinnati Children's has a really active social media presence, and we share cases of the day um, across our channels, particularly on Instagram and Figure One. Um, there's imaging cases of the day. And so if you follow us at Cincy Kids Rad, it's a lot of pediatric radiology, not just liver tumors. Um, and we'd love to have you there too. I'm gonna try to do three things today and we'll do it through um, three different cases. Um, but what I hope to do is describe some of the differences between the common pediatric liver tumors and the adult tumors that coincide with them. Um, I'll describe how and when um, to employ pretext classification. I'll even talk about what, what that means um, and how to use it for pediatric liver tumors, and then talk a little bit about why LIRADS is not applicable for a pediatric liver tumors. Um, I think it's helpful to start with the differential diagnosis of the relatively common pediatric liver tumors. And like adults, they can fall between benign and malignant. Um, the common ones that we're gonna talk about today are really the first um, three on the list, hepatic hemangiomas, hepatoblastoma, and hepatocellular carcinoma. But there are differences um, in the other tumors as well. And unfortunately, we don't have enough time to cover it today. Um, but there, there are 
interesting things with those as well. Um, so the first case is a three and a half month old female who presented with abdominal distension. Um, and I'm gonna show a couple, a series from MRI um, and then show some still images. Um, so this is a T2 weighted MRI. Um, and as you can see, the liver is diffusely abnormal. Um, there are, it's really T2 hyper intense throughout the liver. Um, there are central areas um, of filling defect and then things that look like septation between some of these nodules. There's very little, if any, normal liver here. Um, you can see some areas interspersed as we're in this sort of mid portion of the liver. And as I go lower, you see still that there is very little normal liver. Um, really just down in the, um, in some of the um, inferior aspects of the right lobe of the liver, segments five and six is where we start getting more normal looking liver, but the liver is diffusely abnormal. There's also um, edema, anasarca, um, endocytes. Um, on T1, the liver is hypo-intense. The background liver, you can see pockets of it peeking through that is slightly more hyper-intense to that majority of tumor. Um, and then when we give contrast, this is in the coronal plane. In the hepatic arterial on the left-hand side of the image, the portal venous phase um, in the uh, middle image, and then a more equilibrium phase on the far right-hand side of the image. The tumors display peripheral nodular enhancement that gradually fills in with time. Um, some areas do appear discontinuous, but, but some tumors have, that, have a continuous rim of enhancement that fills in with time, um, and not all of the tumor completely fills in. So this is a hepatic hemangioma. Um, and the question is, are adult and pediatric hemangiomas the same? Um, this is a great way to trigger a pediatric radiologist is talking about hemangiomas as them being the same. I'll call them the adult hemangioma. You can't see me doing my air quotes now, but adult hemangiomas are not hemangiomas. They are venous malformations, and so it's an incorrect name um, to call them hemangiomas. There are some major differences between the adult and pediatric version. Importantly, the adult hemangiomas are not a neoplasm and the pediatric ones are. Um, most or many pediatric um, hemangiomas are GLUT1 positive. The adult hemangiomas are not. And adult hemangiomas do not involute with time. Um, if anything, we see more with time. They, these adult hemangiomas are not present in most instances, at least visible in children. Um, so the hepatic hemangiomas are true vascular neoplasms. They're the most common benign liver tumor in children, and they're more common in girls. Um, patients are often asymptomatic, and many patients, we, we never even know that a hemangioma is present. If, we don't, if the patient doesn't get imaged and is not having symptoms, we don't see that they're there. Um, about 85% of patients who are diagnosed, remembering many we never diagnose, 85% um, of those who are diagnosed are diagnosed in the first two months of life. Um, there are three different types of hepatic hemangioma. There's a focal type. This is the only type that's a congenital hemangioma. So these hemangiomas are present. Um, they can be diagnosed in utero, and they are present at birth. Um, these are often asymptomatic and are a solitary lesion. Patients will rarely have a cutaneous lesion. Um, and these are the one type of um, hepatic hemangiomas that are not GLUT1 positive. Patients, will, um, as I said, present in the prenatal or antenatal period, um, and the tumors regress within the first two years of life. Um, and so these are often rapid, termed rapidly involuting congenital hemangiomas. Um, there are occasional ones that do not involute, um, but the majority of them do. And all of the tumors have a similar appearance, um, on this one, we have an arterial phase with a bit of heterogeneous peripheral enhancement. It does fill in with time. Um, and on the hepatobiliary phase, it is hypo-intense. 
Um, the larger that these lesions get, the less likely they are to completely fill in. And so we see large tumors that have that peripheral enhancement but never fill in completely centrally. Multifocal tumors like um, this patient. Um, so this is another T2-weighted MRI. There are these T2 hyperintense lesions scattered in the liver. And so multifocal means that there is normal liver interspersed between the tumors, um, very different than the first patient I showed in our, our first case. Um, so these are infantile hemangiomas, which is a distinction from the um, focal hemangiomas, which are congenital hemangiomas. So patients with infantile hemangiomas often will have cutaneous lesions. Um, these are the similar lesions, but just in the skin. Um, and so patients with cutaneous hemangiomas um, if patients have more than five, it is recommended that they have a liver ultrasound to look for um, a, for hepatic lesions. These lesions are not present at birth. That's why they're not called congenital hemangiomas. Um, instead, they grow rapidly in the first year of life and then slowly involute over the next five years. Um, so by school age, the tumors are usually gone. Um, and then in distinction, the final um, type is the diffuse type. Um, that's the type the patient had at the beginning. So there's little to no normal liver that is interspersed within these lesions. Um, these, like the multifocal, are infantile hemangiomas. Again, patients will have cutaneous lesions. Um, there's rapid growth in the first year of life and slow involution by five years. Um, and so patients with the multifocal and diffuse can have then congenital heart failure. Um, one other interesting way that they may present is with hypothyroidism. Okay, um, case number two. Um, this is an 18-month-old male with an abdominal mass and presented with abdominal distension. It tends to be the way a lot of children present. They're not, they don't have symptoms of jaundice, don't have um, abdominal pain or uh, other things. It tend to be a mass that's palpated often by a, a caregiver um, while giving a bath. Um, in this patient, so again, T2-weighted uh, um, images from an MRI, there is this large hepatic mass within the left lobe of the liver, um, occupying the left medial and lateral sections. There are also large flow voids. This is a um, portal vein, but there are these odd vessels at the periphery of the mass, and we often see this um, in patients with these large tumors. Um, so the mass is a bit heterogeneous, has some T2 hyperintensity, other areas that are similar signal intensity to the background liver. When we give contrast, we use hepatobiliary agents for almost all indications, all, all type of liver imaging in children. Um, on the hepatic arterial phase, there is um, enhancement compared to the background liver, so it is hyper-enhancing. On the portal venous phase, it remains hyper-intense compared to the background liver, but it starts to wash out a little bit in the equilibrium phase. And on the hepatobiliary phase, it's hypo-intense. I'm presenting this pattern, but and this patient has hepatoblastoma, but hepatoblastomas can be very heterogeneous, and one pattern does not is not necessarily similar to the next pattern in patients with these tumors. Um, this patient has an unusual um, variant on the hepatobiliary phase. We see multiple hyperintense nodules throughout the liver. Um, that seems to happen in a very small percentage of patients. And when we've seen that, many of those patients will have associated um, familial adipo um, adenomatous polyposis, and these tend to be precursor-type lesions, or what we've called them, or um, adenoma-like lesions. Um, so hepatoblastoma is the most common primary liver tumor of childhood, and the third most uh, um, common abdominal malignancy. Number one and two would be Wilms tumor followed by neuroblastoma for abdominal malignancies in childhood. Hepatoblastoma is more common in males um, and the median age is around 19 months of age. A very small percent of patients will present after age four. Um, and so hepatoblastoma is associated with a lot of 
um, other entities. The most important association is with prematurity. Um, and patients who are of a extremely low birth weight and extreme prematurity have a higher risk. It's thought to be related um, to um, oxygen um, and free radicals associated with oxygen, but the, the true cause, or if that's true, is unknown still. Um, other associations I alluded to, like familial adenomatous polyposis, other syndromes like Beckwith-Wiedemann are associated with hepatoblastoma. Um, and so when we're talking about hepatoblastoma and really all pediatric liver tumors, um, it's important to know what the surgeons and the oncologists want to know. Um, and what they want to know in pediatric liver tumors is, is, is different. Um, we care about something called pretext. Um, and unfortunately, there's not much pretext humor. This is the best I could do with the pretext joke. But pre so pretext stands for pretreatment extent of tumor. Um, it's a radiologic staging system or a classification system, um, and it's used to predict surgical complexity. Um, we call it pretext most of the time. The, officially, pretext is at diagnosis or before treatment starts, and then it's called post-text after treatment has started. So then it would be post-treatment extent of tumor. Um, so you might see pretext or post-text, but that's the difference. It's all the same thing, and how you perform the classification is the same at any time point. Um, so with pretext, um, the rationale for it is that surgery is curative. Um, chemotherapy is important, but the, the cures with hepatoblastoma happen because of surgery. And so we're trying to do things to help surgeons understand the complexity and to help them to decide if, which type of surgery they'll need to do, um, whether that's a resection or a transplant. Um, Pretext is used in all the different cooperative group trials, and it has been shown to be an independent predictor of overall survival. The most recent update of the pretext system was in 2017. Um, I'll leave the QR code up for a second if you want. That will go to the, um, the abstract at PubMed so you can download it. Um, but the pretext classification system in this article gives um, fairly exquisite detail on how to perform this type of assessment, um, going into details of things such as liver anatomy. Um, I'll touch on a little bit on the next couple of slides um, and how we define each of the um, annotation factors, which I'll talk about later. Um, so I'm going to summarize a lot of what's in that paper, but there's a lot more detail in this paper. So there's three things that are important with pretext. Um, the first part and the most, most important, most predictive is the pretext group. Um, and so that's determining which sections of the liver are involved with tumor. The next thing that we look at is the vascular involvement. Um, and we define vascular involvement in some detail, and I'll go over that. Um, and then the third thing are different annotation factors. Pulmonary metastases are one type of annotation factor, um, but there are several others. And so we'll, we'll go through that. Um, and again, importantly, pretext it. So while I'm presenting it with a patient with hepatoblastoma, it is used with all liver tumors. Um, in, in children, including hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, so the pretext group, as I said, um, it's determined um, by the sections that are involved. And so the, what we're looking for is the number of contiguous sections of the liver that need to be resected to completely remove the tumor. Because um, remember, surgery is curative. Um, and so there's four different pretext groups because there's four sections of the liver. Um, and you either have, can remove one section, two sections, three sections, or all four sections in a transplant. So for pretext one, the tumor has to be in the right posterior section or the left medial, I'm sorry, the left lateral section, because those are the only two places where you could perform a conventional resection and remove the tumor completely. If tumor is in the right anterior section or left medial section, you'd have to remove two sections. We don't want to do these, these odd surgeries. And so removing like the left medial section um, is difficult and, and puts vascular supply at risk. It becomes a more heroic type surgery. 
a pretext two tumor is a tumor where you'd have to remove two sections of the liver. Um, and so there's lots of different options for this. Um, the example I was just discussing, this one, um, where the tumor is in the left medial section only, um, you'd have to remove two sections of the liver doing a left um, hepatectomy to remove the tumor completely. Um, the tumor can span multiple sections of the liver, um, or it could be multifocal in two sections. The one special case is a caudate-only tumor. That's defined as a pretext two because you either have to do a left hepatectomy or a right hepatectomy to remove the caudate. They don't remove the caudate um, in isolation. A pretext three tumor means you have to remove three sections of the liver to completely remove the tumor. Um, and so probably the most confusing um, and one of the most common types is this central type tumor that involves the right anterior section and the left medial section of the liver. Um, for that um, tumor type, while surgeons can do a mesohepatectomy, um, they don't like to. It doesn't always have the best outcomes and it's considered the most heroic type surgery. And so instead they would do an extended left or an extended right hepatectomy um, to resect the tumor completely. So we call those pretext three. And then pretext four means every section of the liver is involved with tumor. Um, almost always that's a multifocal tumor. The one in the middle is sort of an infiltrative tumor. Um, those are uncommon but occur. And the, the type I can see that involves every section but is a giant mass, I'm not sure I've ever seen that. Um, most times it's a, there are giant tumors, but most times it's squishing one section of the liver out of the way, and it's not truly in that section. Um, so I'm n I've never seen that type, um, but I have seen the other two. Um, and by far of pretext four, the most common is a multifocal tumor. Um, and so pretext fours almost always will go to transplant. Um, the second step is determining vascular involvement. Um, this gives important information regarding surgical complexity. It also gives a lot of prognostic information. Um, and with vascular involvement, that's one of the factors that will increase risk stratification. Um, so we define vascular involvement in two ways. Um, the, from this slide, you either need all three gray boxes involved or any one pink box. Um, and so what that means um, either tumor obliterating or encasing more than 50%, all of the veins, um, the right hepatic vein, the middle hepatic vein, and the left hepatic vein, all three of those, or tumor thrombus in any one vessel. The, the exception with the um, encasing or obliterating would be the inferior vena cava. If that vessel is encased by more than 50% or obliterated completely, we would call that hepatic venous involvement. Um, and we're talking about the intrahepatic portion of the inferior vena cava. Um, that can sometimes be difficult. And obliteration, well, our definition of that means it's completely not visible. Um, not that it's squished or we see a small little sliver of it. Um, it has to be completely gone. Usually there's going to be enlargement of the azagous vessels if that occurs. Um, so some examples. Here is, this is gonna be one where the tumor obliterates the inferior vena cava, but it also encases the um, inferior vena cava. So here's the inferior vena cava um, in the center of the tumor, um, in the center of the liver, in the center of the image. As we go down, tumor is now encasing it. Um, it's surrounding the inferior vena cava by more than 50%. Um, and now the vessel is obliterated. And as we go down lower, that again, the inferior vena cava is completely obliterated. This is a different patient, um, and the arrow is pointing to the inferior vena cava completely encased by tumor. So in this case, it's surrounded 360 degrees. The portal vein is essentially the same thing, um, but with the, in, with the hepatic veins, there's three hepatic veins. With the portal vein, there's only two. And so you have to have two gray boxes for the portal vein or any one pink box. 
um, the definitions for those boxes and for obliteration or tumor thrombus um, are the same. Um, there are a couple of special cases with the portal vein. Anytime we see um, cavernous transformation, we are assuming that the portal vein is thrombosed um, and are assuming that that is tumor involvement. We do not try to distinguish bland thrombus from tumor thrombus. Um, we call any type of thrombus, in this case, tumor thrombus or tumor in vein. Um, in this case, there is tumor thrombus. Um, the arrows are pointing to both the right and left hepatic vein. Um, but it doesn't have to be completely thrombosed, like in this case, where the uh, tumor is obliterating um, the vessel or completely obliterating flow. Um, in this case, there is um, thrombus within the left portal vein near the umbilical seg um, segment of the portal vein. It's not completely obstructing flow, but we still call that tumor thrombus. This would still be positive. Um, the one thing I guess I haven't mentioned when we're talking about vascular involvement is that it has to be in the main branches of those vessels. Um, and so in the hepatic veins, that means before, as you're going peripherally, before it bifurcates at all, um, and for the portal veins, before it bifurcates. Um, and so as we got a little bit deeper, if we get into the umbilical segment, that portion of tumor was in there would not count as venous involvement. It's just in the, the central vessels. Then the third step of pretext is the annotation factors. Um, again, these predict surgical complexity and a worsened prognosis. There are six uh, additional annotation factors. The portal vein and hepatic vein are considered annotation factors. Um, there are P and V when we talk about that annotation as P positive for portal vein and V positive for hepatic veins or inferior vena cava. Um, the remaining six, though, are slightly uh, are a slightly lesser degree than the um, than the vessels, and so we'll go through the definitions of each of them. Um, and again, in that manuscript, it goes into more detail. Um, so the first is extrahepatic disease. This is one of the hardest to diagnose, um, particularly when we're talking about invasion into the abdominal wall or the diaphragm. Um, it's much easier to see when we're looking for peritoneal nodules. Um, to call a peritoneal nodule positive, we're looking for one nodule more than one centimeter in size or two or more nodules greater than five millimeters in size. The arrowhead at the diaphragm was, a, in this case, is about um, seven millimeters, um, and the um, one at the bottom in the peritoneum, is a, that's the full arrow, that's about a centimeter in diameter. Um, and this tumor overall is about 12 centimeters in its long axial dimension. Other things that we're looking for um, for extrahepatic disease would be tumors that cross boundaries or tissue planes, or if we're seeing um, normal tissues surrounding tumor by more than 180 degrees. Multifocal disease just means we need inter normal liver interspersed. Um, so if the tumor connects in any way, we would not call it multifocal. Um, in this example, there are um, two distinct lesions. Um, and we're looking for just more than one discrete lesion with normal intervening tissue. Um, this is one of the real important um, reasons why we use hepatobiliary agents for all, all liver tumor imaging. We often find these satellite lesions on the hepatobiliary phase only. Um, and this is an example of that. Those three arrows point to three foci or satellite lesions that changes this kid's tumor from a pretext three in this in this case to a pretext four, um, and sets them up completely differently for a surgery. Um, the surgery being a difference being from resection to transplant. Tumor rupture, um, we're looking for more than one finding of hemorrhage, um, and so it with one or more findings. So we have um, reasons um, for all the different modalities. On CT, we're looking for fluid of a density greater than 25 Hounsfield units. It's a little, that number is picked just based on, um, on having a higher degree of specificity. 
um, we often see free fluid in the abdomen, and it's often around in the teens to the very low 20s. So the higher the Hounsfield unit, the greater specificity. Um, in this case, the arrow is also pointing to a visible defect in the tumor capsule. On MRI, we're looking for blood degradation products, um, and on ultrasound, heterogeneous echogenic debris within the fluid. Um, we could also see internal complexity or septations within the fluid. Um, we define the caudate specifically, the caudate involvement. Um, and so um, the caudate starts at a line that's perpendicular to the axis of the inferior vena cava um, and the, the caudate itself. So that white line draws that arrow. Um, the left margin goes at the ligamentum venosum anterior more margin to the um, porta hepatis and ligamentum teres, the superior margin um, towards the dome of the liver, and the inferior margin um, where the liver passes between the main portal vein and the inferior vena cava. Um, and so looking at the caudate in both the axial and coronal plane. And tumor anywhere um, to the right-hand side and the left part of the liver, but to the right side, anything colored in that brown color is considered the caudate. Um, we define lymph node metastases mostly based on size. There are some, um, some criteria as well based on the shape or morphology. Um, lymph node metastases are extremely rare in hepatoblastoma. Um, they are more common in hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, which tends to be in older kids. And then pulmonary metastases, um, we're looking for any of the following criteria to be met. So we want either um, one nodule greater than five millimeters in diameter or two or more nodules greater than three millimeters in diameter. Um, if there's any question, pathology is important. Um, and the, the challenge in, in the smallest babies are is size a one centimeter nodules, for example, going to that gets to be very large in a little baby. Um, and so this big nodule is still about seven millimeters in diameter. Um, this patient reached it based on um, on having more that were um, more than one that are five millimeters in size. Okay, so that's pretext and hepatoblastoma. Um, and then our third case is a 17 year old girl um, with abdominal pain. Um, so on T1-weighted MRI, there is that hypo-intense mass in the left lobe of the liver. Um, it is slightly hyper-intense compared to the background liver. On T2-weighted images, it does have a central scar. It enhances more than the background liver on the hepatic arterial phase of imaging. There is another um, component of the liver that enhances greater than the background, um, but it is not involved with tumor. And then on the portal venous phase, it is iso-intense to the remainder of the liver for the majority of that tumor. Um, so hepatocellular carcinoma, it's the, most, it's the second most common malignancy of the liver in children, but it's pretty rare. Um, it's different than adult HCC. Um, 30, it, most of the newer literature says around 30% of patients will have a pre-existing liver condition. Um, some of the early, the previous literature set up to 50% have a, an abnormal liver at diagnosis. Um, these tumors are often CMAP mutated. There's a higher, um, higher percentage of patients have loss of heterozygosity on 13Q, and there are lower levels of cyclin D1 compared to adults. The condition, there are conditions that predispose. Um, again, that's the general minority. Those are things like glycogen storage diseases, um, sclerosis and cholangitis, familial cholestatic jaundice, allergial syndrome, um, biliary atresia, things like that um, that can predispose to HCC. Um, and so then the, the question here is, does LIRADS apply to pediatric liver tumors? Um, and so for some of my pediatric colleagues on the call who may not have heard of LIRADS, it's the liver imaging reporting and data system. And so it's a comprehensive system to standardize the terminology, technique, interpretation, reporting, and data collection of liver imaging. Um, and there's really detailed guide on how to um, perform a LIRADS assessment. The QR code will take you to the page on ACR website that, where you can download the manual. Um, the, the key element of the manual is in this 
image, um, and I'll go through it a little bit. But there have been many studies on LIRADs in adults. Um, in general, it says that there is substantial inner reader agreement using LIRADs with a kappa around 0.7. Um, and comparing the different guidelines, show, looking at the um, performance, saying the accuracy is somewhere in the 80% range, um, often in the high 80s. So should we use LIRADs in children? Um, well, I think importantly in the LIRADs document, it says do not apply to people less than 18 years of age. Um, looking at the other do not applies, they're all of the things that predispose children to um, to hepatocellular carcinoma. So there are a lot of reasons not to use it. Also importantly, very few pediatric patients have had hepatitis B long enough or hepatitis C long enough um, to really develop HCC. Um, and the cirrhosis that children get is often due to the things in the um, column or in the row below. So there are also some very important differences between the pediatric and adult populations. Um, probably the most important is the prevalence of disease. Only about 50 patients are diagnosed with HCC in the pediatric age in the United States each year. That's compared to 25,000 in adults. Um, so when we're doing a screening test, the um, prevalence is really important to understand how the predictive values. Um, there is, but remember, we do minimal screening. Very few patients um, have underlying liver disease. So if only 30% of patients have underlying liver disease, um, we're talking about 15 of 50 um, that are then positive. Um, kids often have, uh, are often, will have a larger tumor size at diagnosis, so we're not trying to distinguish other, le other lesion types. Um, we can tell it's a bad tumor. Um, and the morphology of these tumors is often a, a bit different. Um, so there are a couple of things. So this patient has alpha-1 antitrypsin. Um, if we go through the different LIRADS criteria, um, we'll see. So first, um, we have non-rim arterial phase hyperenhancement. That's on the um, arterial phase of imaging. If we measure the tumor, this one is 4 centimeters in diameter, um, so greater than that 20 millimeters. And then there is uh, the one additional major factor, that um, non-peripheral washout. Um, so this would be a LIRADS-5 lesion. Um, but it's a HNF1 adenoma in a patient with um, alpha-1 antitrypsin. So there have been a, a couple of papers. One of the important ones is looking at nodules in post-fontan livers. Um, in this article, they said that benign hyperenhancing masses may demonstrate washout and be mistaken for HCC by imaging criteria. I think the challenge with this article um, is that they were followed, uh, most of the lesions were not biopsied. Um, and we know that HCC development um, in Fontan patients can be slow and they can be lesions that live there for a long time and then go out of control. Um, so we have to be a little bit careful um, about that. We still, in PEDS, will often use LIRADs to distinguish worrisome nodules. Um, the other thing will be then specificity. Um, and so this is images from the patient with hepatoblastoma I showed earlier. Um, we have, um, again, going through the LIRADS features, we have non-rim arterial phase hyperenhancement. Um, when we measure the tumor, this case the tumor is about 10 centimeters in diameter, um, and so it's bigger than 20. And there is that washout. Um, it's mild washout, but there is washout compared to the background. So it would hit LIRADS-5. Um, we could say because of age, it's not likely to be hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, again, there are those funny lesions in the background um, in this patient, so it can be confusing. This one probably would fit better as the um, LIRADS-M because it's definitely malignant, but not HCC specific because this is an 18-month-old child. Um, so there's only been one study evaluating LIRADS um, to date in children. Um, this came out of um, WashU. Um, and the performance statistics in general look pretty good um, from at least sensitivity specificity side. The problem is the predictive values. Um, so the performance of LIRADS-5 um, is with a positive predictive value, 33 to 75%. Um, but 
remember our screening population is quite low um, and most lesions are not going to be HCC in children. So a positive predicted value, um, that is a problem there. And then the negative predicted value of a one, two, or three lesion is low. Um, so again, not great statistics when you're talking about a screening test. There is a pediatric LIRADS work group. These are the members of that work group um, who work along with me. Um, and we have been working towards a statement um, it has just been accepted to radiology, so look for it coming soon. In that, what, we're, what we do is talk about imaging parameters, image interpretation, and reporting um, of pediatric liver tumors. We try to answer all of these questions. Um, and the point of this is not for you to read the questions, but the point is to show you that there is a lot of questions that we're trying to answer um, and to provide guidance for, um, for the general radiologists. Um, as we go through each of those questions, we tried to come at it with a structured approach. So we evaluated the quality of evidence using the grade classification system. Um, and so the quality of evidence is rated as A, B, C, or D, with A being um, high and D being very low quality of evidence. A would be like um, multi-center trials or high quality trials with consistent results. Um, D is expert opinion. Um, and you'll see there's a good amount that's expert opinion. Um, we also then did a strength of recommendation. This was survey-based um, for all of the LIRADS group members, um, that work group members, all voted, um, and we, create, we made a score of 1 to 1.49, very strong, and 3 to 4 is weak. Um, and so we'll present both the grade and the score. I'm not going to go through all of the recommendations we made, just to highlight some of the recommendations that we made. Um, and so, for example, we recommended application of pretext staging system in pediatric patients with hepatoblastoma or hepatocellular carcinoma at all imaging time points. Um, and we gave that a grade of A. There are many cooperative group trials showing that pretext is a um, is prognostic, um, and our strength of recommendation is very strong. So this is a different recommendation. Um, so we recommended MRI with hepatobiliary agents for assessment of known or suspected focal pediatric liver lesions at the initial imaging time point. In this one, there's only really one study that's looked at this, um, the impact of hepatocyte phase imaging um, in that study, we saw that it improved our diagnostic confidence level, um, that it improved lesion detection, um, and improved, uh, so it improved the confidence of radiologists. Um, so it's only one study, a single center. So the grade is C, but the strength of recommendation was very strong. Um, you'll notice it's even stronger than the use of pretext. So the experts in pediatric liver imaging recommend using the hepatobiliary phase. Um, and hepatocyte-specific um, agents. This is another example of a, solitaire, of a satellite lesion that's identified only using um, the hepatobiliary phase of imaging. Um, the work group recommended MRI um, for imaging in patients who have a resected lesion. Um, this patient had um, a mesohepatectomy. I said we don't do that very often, but occasionally it happens. Um, and so, and then had recurrence in the right remaining um, seg section. Um, and so, in this case, there was recurrence. Um, it was not visible at two months. It started being visible at five months, but the whole um, right-sided remnant had funny enhancement, um, and not all of that was tumor. Some of it was just poor perfusion. Um, and so, at um, a couple weeks after that middle CT, a hepatobiliary agent was used and helped to find to define the tumor. It's often used to help us find tumor elsewhere. So again, our, our grade recommendation of evidence was only a level C, but our strength of recommendation was very strong. Um, we made no recommendation on screening liver cancer in children with diffuse liver diseases. Um, and I'll, I'll highlight, there's very there's such wide variation in the different predisposing syndromes, um, and liver tumors are overall rare in children. That makes it 
really impossible at this time for us to give strong evidence or a strong recommendation across the board. Something like beckwith wiedemann has lots of study and has a very strong recommendation um, with, with good um, evidence and frequency of screening um, and following those, that group's recommendations is appropriate. Other um, diseases like progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis. Um, in this example, there's a 16-page article um, that's a systematic review of the disease. And you'll see at the top, I searched for imaging and searched for all types of words right, with imaging, and there were zero occurrences. The imaging was not mentioned once, um, and there are really no recommendations for how to image these patients. Um, so there's such a wide spectrum of these different diseases. Um, the work group recommended using CT only for a few reasons. Um, if there's a contraindication for MRI, if patients need anesthesia um, but are at institutions who that anesthesia can't be provided in one setting or can't provide anesthesia at all, um, or if because they still need a chest CT, um, if that can't be done under one anesthesia setting. So there's very little evidence on that. Um, the evidence is mostly around anesthesia. Um, it's a very strong recommendation, but not as strong as some of the ones around pretext or hepatobiliary agents. Um, if CT is performed, we recommend that there be an arterial phase and a late portal phase for known or suspected hepatoblastoma or HCC. So that means we know there's a tumor there. Um, we don't know necessarily what it is, but we've seen something on imaging, like with an ultrasound to start. Um, again, very little evidence. Our strength of recommendation is only strong here. Um, in patients who we would be doing screening, like in a patient with Fontan hepatopathy, um, we recommend three phases. Um, and this is a fairly weak recommendation overall. Um, in this, our only hope has been using some of the LIRADS features to say which lesions are worrisome and would represent something either needing closer follow-up or need a biopsy. Um, and so that's why we recommend the three phases there, knowing, um, again, this is patients who need a CT who can't get an MRI. We would recommend MRI as our first line. Um, and so we, we take a recommendation where we're doing three phases very seriously in kids. Um, so I'll wrap up and get to some questions. Um, the first thing I hope to I impressed with you today is that liver tumors in kids are different than um, adult liver tumors. Um, so things like hemangiomas are not, in adults, are not true hemangiomas. Um, I didn't talk about FNH lesions. Um, I forgot to remove that from this slide. And there are different types of hepatocellular carcinomas. Um, pretext is important, um, and it matters for all liver tumor types. So to do a pretext, we first look for the pretext group. Um, we then look for vascular involvement, um, and finally, the annotation factors. And you can look for that article um, to read the details. Um, and then finally, LIRADS does not really apply um, to children. We do use um, it to help guide us towards biopsy in some patients, but it's, it is still uncommon. The pediatric LIRADS group is coming um, with a recommendation in radiology but it's only gonna provide recommendations on how to image. It's not gonna to say to use these LIRADS criteria. Um, so I will stop there and I think we can open it up for some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. I really felt the fund of knowledge. Um, I'm getting a fund of knowledge through this uh, lecture. I mean, you have in-depth understanding and knowledge of the pediatric liver uh, tumors and beyond what I have imagined. Um, and this is serious and honest statement. So thank you very much, Alex, for this informative and comprehensive lecture.